Vauxhall Insignia Sport Tourer 1.5 Turbo 165, 2017 Review. Midrange Petrol Engine Suits Vauxhall's new family-sized load lugger well. Another refined, comfortable, easy to drive and attractively priced insignia. What is it? Another unexplored corner of the Vauxhall Insignia model range. Vauxhall's family-sized saloon and estate is available with a trio of petrol engines, the middle sitting 1.5-liter turbocharged option developing 163 bhp. We've already tested the new wagon in entry-level 138 bhp petrol form, and in saloon guise as the 256 bhp 2.0-liter turbo petrol range topper. Now is our first chance to find out if the middle sitting option is the sweetest of all three. In the enlarged estate version of the Insignia, that engine makes for claimed fuel economy of 46.3 miles per gallon combined, rated CO2 emissions of 139 g km and claimed 0 to 62 miles per hour acceleration in under 8 and a half seconds. An equivalent Ford Mondeo is not only more expensive but marginally slower accelerating, though a natch more fuel efficient, a like for like Skoda Octavia has the Vauxhall beaten across the board and by bigger margins. But then neither the Ford nor the Skoda quite equal the insignia on all round value for money, the big Vauxhall combining a sub pound 20k asking price with a near 600 liter boot, a very room cabin, competitive performance and economy claims, and a standard equipment list that includes touchscreen navigation, smartphone mirroring and an in-car Wi-Fi hotspot. What's it like? Refined, flexible and fairly economical. This isn't the first representative of the more affordable end of the Insignia range to impress us, mind you, and if you're interested in this car for the reasons we expect you to be, it'll be the more affordable models you'll probably be interested in. But, just like the 108 BHP 1.6 liter CDTI, this Insignia has the accessible torque to move what's undoubtedly a large car's mass quite easily, not to mention good cruising manners and creditable efficiency. The engine settles to a distant hum at idle, staying smooth and quiet through typical operating revs right up until close to the red line. In cars priced as aggressively as the Insignia, mechanical refinement isn't a quality you expect, but this one certainly has it, and enough of it even to clench a marginal buying decision if such things are high among your priorities. Don't expect premium branded equivalents to necessarily be quieter. The car's controls are medium weighted and all perfectly pleasant to use, with little notch or spring to the manual gear levers action and a well-tuned clutch. Getting the car moving is easy, therefore, and, though there's less need than you might think to hop up and down that gearbox in order to preserve your momentum, when you need to change gear it's never a chore. The engine's 184 pounds foot of torque, present from just 2000 revolutions per minute, shoulders the insignia's mass quite easily, and you find yourself leaving high gears in train when speeding up on your way out of urban areas and allowing the car to accelerate from low revs. On the motorway, where you need to work both engine and gearbox a bit harder to overtake with confidence, things are a little different. But there's certainly enough accessible torque here to suggest that the car could handle a cabin full of family, a boot full of luggage and even a light trailer or caravan respectably well. The Insignia's suspension feels pretty conventional in its dynamic execution, bringing plenty of ride comfort, good handling stability and respectable cabin isolation to the table, and prioritizing all three above any handling verve, just as it probably should. The car's commitment to do what really matters well would make it a fine long-distance machine and a very pleasant, secure handling car to drive every day. Through corners the car grips fairly keenly, and has decent handling response and balance for its size, making it easy to place. But body control is better around those bends than it is along a rising and falling B road, where the car's vertical composure can be found wanting if you hurry it. The official new European driving cycle fuel economy quote for the car is 46.3 miles per gallon, and, quite rarely, 
that's not such a considerable overestimation of the car's true potential. Our test car returned between 42 and 45 miles per gallon on its trip computer during a couple of mixed and reasonably length test drives, which is certainly a good enough result to warrant considering it in place of a diesel for all but the highest mileage user. That the new Insignia's cabin over delivers on equipment, comfort and space we already know after several acquaintances with it. There's enough cabin space here to earn the car a rank among the most practical in its price bracket for a family of four, as well as three ice-fix child seat anchorages across the second row seats which remains quite a rarity at least until you get into the MPV market. On material richness there's a more plain look and feel to the dashboard's fixtures and fittings than in plenty of rivals, so you could certainly buy nicer for the money but you'd be unlikely to get so much kit for your money. The Sport Tourer's 560-liter boot isn't the very largest among cars of its kind, but it's certainly large enough to swallow longer bulky items loaded long ways. At this level you have to pay extra for 40 hours 20 minutes 40 seconds split folding back seats, but that's the only blight on an otherwise impressive showing on practicality and load carrying potential. Ford Shelby Mustang GT 350R 2017 Review Ford has tried to turn the Mustang into a track machine by putting it on a diet and giving it a new engine. Has it worked? What is it? To put it politely, the Ford Mustang GT isn't the first car you'd choose to develop into a stripped out, no compromise track machine. For one thing it's a sizable old bus, it's 30 centimeters longer than the Porsche 911, a rather more obvious candidate, and some 10 centimeters wider, and for another, it weighs the better part of 1,800 kilograms. There wasn't a great deal Ford Performance could do about the Mustang's size, but to give the Shelby GT 350R a fighting chance on track, it ditched the rear seats, stereo sat nav and air conditioning, although the latter three items can be added back in optionally. The wheels are exotic carbon fiber items, too, saving 6 kilograms at each corner. The total weight loss over the 5.0 GT is 60 kilograms, which is useful if not exactly transformative. The entire chassis has been overhauled with upgraded components and a much more track-focused setup while a comprehensive aerodynamic package promises much more downforce than the regular car. Most unusually, though, the warbling V8 engine that powers the conventional Mustang has been ditched for a high revving 5.2-liter flat-plane crank V8. That's something of a departure for an American muscle car, flat-plane cranks and high revving V8s have been the preserve of European sports cars until now. The new motor revs beyond 8,000 revolutions per minute, whereas the outgoing crossplane V8 doesn't reach far beyond 6,500 revolutions per minute. The power and torque figures hint at a rev V8 rather than a lazy, torque rich bruiser, 2, 526 bhp at 7,500 revolutions per minute and 429 pounds foot at 4,750 revolutions per minute are not typical Mustang numbers. The soundtrack isn't typical Mustang either, the rumbling score replaced by highly strung snarls and barks. What's it like? As the most extreme Mustang to date, the GT 350R goes to lengths not even the GT 350 model would have considered in the pursuit of racetrack performance. In fact, Ford says it didn't even concern itself with trying to make the GT 350R work on the public road. The standard car's plush leather chairs have been swapped out for heavily bolstered regress, while the steering wheel is wrapped in Olcantara. The sports seats are actually set an inch or two lower than the standard items, and with the steering column at full extension, the seating position is just about perfect. If Ford wants the GT 350R to be assessed as a track car, there are few better places to do just that than Thruxton. 
The UK's fastest race track is a stern test of car and driver, mixing ballsy high-speed sequences with tight and technical sections. The GT350R is more than up to it. Whereas the Mustang GT feels about as adept on circuit as a canal boat would, this stripped-out model feels right at home. That much more aggressive suspension setup takes away all of the wallow and floatiness of the standard car, replacing it with agility, control and precision. There are sections of Thruxton that demand so many different things from a car all at once, the start of the lap, for instance, combines a fast left-hand bend with a sharp crest and a heavy braking zone. Many cars would be completely flummoxed by that sequence, but the GT350R swallows it up without any trouble whatsoever. The steering is ultra-sharp and direct, the big Brembo brakes are excellent and the fat Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 tires generate enormous grip and traction. In the high-speed sections, such as the intimidatingly fast church corner, the car is incredibly stable, thanks in part to the aero package. There's so little body roll or dive under braking that you quickly forget just how big and, let's be honest, heavy the GT350R is. Chasing an 8,000 revolutions per minute redline in a Mustang is a novel experience. The Zingy V8 is right at the heart of the driving experience and it flings the car along at a mighty rate. It's also so much more responsive than the GT's cross-plane V8, it takes only a quick stab of the accelerator to bring the revs up during a downshift, whereas you really have to get into the GT's throttle pedal to awaken the engine, the engine.